is Hollywood. Off Script with Michelle and Michael. Hi, I'm glad that you're joining us. Today we're going to be talking about Hollywood Groundbreakers. And what that means are the folks that started the motion picture industry in Hollywood uh, and throughout the decades, the people who have broken ground and made way for new innovative film techniques and acting styles and studios. Exactly. Of course, I have my favorites and I know Michelle does as well too. Ooh, yeah. But since I'm a gentleman, ladies first. Thank you, Mike. Well, I feel that the early silent film groundbreakers were vital to the industry in setting the tone. And four very prominent silent film actors, directors, and uh, creative forces came together to form United Artists Studios. And that was Charlie Chaplin, his great friend, Douglas Fairbanks, Douglas Fairbanks' wife, Mary Pickford, as well as director, D.W. Griffith. And they formed United Artists together to allow the artist to flourish. So it really, the name almost describes what the studio was, the coming together. And was the this, United this was different than the other studios, that's why they were forming this way? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. they, they just didn't want to be, you know, hampered by budget and you've got to get this out and, and, and churn it out and, and compromising their artistic integrity. So um, they formed United Artists together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a big deal. And uh, so I feel like they really broke the ground uh, for artists and having them being able to pursue what their stories were and the depth of their character. So, so those are my favorites. And Very since you were a gentleman and listened to me, and I'd like to now know yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's quite similar to what you're talking mm -hmm. about here. Um, in 1994, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who at that time was actually working for Walt Disney Pictures, had left the company and joined with a couple of his friends in the industry, Steven Spielberg and David Geffen. And together they formed DreamWorks SKG, mm -hmm. which again was a studio. Mm -hmm. And the entire concept behind that was the idea of being as artist friendly as possible. They even went so far as to actually coming up with a de very detailed plan for a new physical production facility. Mm -hmm that would allow everybody to live and work in the same area and to really allow talent to flourish. So it's That's very similar to what you're talking about there too. And yes. I think it was pretty groundbreaking, especially considering the fact that up until that time, there really had been no major new studios developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a very brave move on their part, mm -hmm. I think. And it's always great when like, you know, they knew each other, they were friends, coworkers, mm -hmm. coming together uh, with a common goal. And, and forming that um, foundation for actors and directors and things to flourish. Right. It's yeah. kind of another example of how history seems to repeat itself within it the film industry. Yeah. I wonder if one inspired the other, if they were thinking about United Artists. I wonder, too. Were, it probably was. was. I would imagine so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, uh, it, they turned out wonderful product. So. And uh, now are they still in existence? DreamWorks still exists today. It's actually changed hands a couple of different mm -hmm. times in terms of moving around to where the studio actually existed. It's actually been a sort of a sub-label under other... Mm -hmm studios and most recently, actually just a couple months ago, it was announced that Spielberg was going to be taking the DreamWorks brand and folding it back into Universal, which was his original home. Isn't that wonderful? And they'll actually be releasing pictures there uh, under great. the DreamWorks title. Yes, I know for Spielberg, Universal as a studio was extremely important in his career and uh, you know, Hollywood lore, we've talked about that several times, um, about how Steven Spielberg got his start at Universal. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell me the story that you know about? The big rumor of Steven Spielberg yes. sneaking in on a lot mm -hmm. and finding an empty office to call his own mm -hmm. and basically decided he was going to go ahead and set up shop until one day he was discovered mm -hmm. and eventually was offered a job. Yeah, which I think is very bold. And I think that boldness and that gutsiness is what really makes a groundbreaker. Somebody that's going to say, I'm going to come in, I'm going to lay new ground, or I'm going to sneak into an office <laughs> right. and make it my own, even though I really don't work there, and, and to take a chance. And sometimes those chances just end up opening doors for not only for themselves, but for others. Exactly. And I, I think that's, you know, exactly. uh, that, that takes a lot of bravery and creativity, and, you know, that's, that's what Hollywood is. <laughs> I agree completely. How about back in history? Do you have any other groundbreakers that work for you? I do, uh, and it's a, a gentleman named uh, Jesse L. Lasky, 
And he's lost, you know, that name is lost to uh, history uh, a lot for folks that don't I'm not follow. Even familiar, so. Yeah, well, he was, um, you know, he was an early filmmaker and he was actually out on the East Coast. And a lot of early filmmakers were located on the East Coast, New Jersey and New York. And, you know, the climate there just was not conducive to filming like mm -hmm. it is in Southern California. So uh, he actually sent out. Uh, Cecil B. DeMille, and that DeMille, I'm sure, is a very familiar name to a lot of folks, but uh, quite a character, and said, you know, try to find this location where we can film a motion picture. Mm -hmm. And DeMille did find that, and uh, they ended up forming, uh, through a few incarnations and things, Paramount Studios. And, but when DeMille came down, he looked for a small, we'll call it a venue <laughs> or a small location where they could film. He just found this little barn that was on the corner of, you know, a Vine and Hollywood or just some small corner location. And they ended up filming the first feature length motion picture in Hollywood. It was called The Squaw Man. I believe it was released uh, right around 1916. So that's another groundbreaker. That's, uh, and is there a specific reason why they chose Southern California or Hollywood? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I, I, I did say it's just because Southern California is beautiful. <laughs> and the climate is so predictable. Yep. And you also had a lot of locations where you could be up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. You could have a desert scene. You could be down by the ocean. You know, you, there was just the ability to have a flexible location. You didn't have to worry about being rained out and lost days, and it was just certainly more efficient. And as I mentioned before, a lot of studios and, and people in the industry started in the um, in New York or on the East Coast, right. because that's where a lot of Nickelodeons or the you know the small um, first studios exactly. and um, theaters started. So that naturally, I mean, was kind of born there, and then they came to Hollywood and they stayed. So it sounds like they uh, basically chose this location very similar to reasons and why locations are actually chosen today. That's correct. Yeah. It comes down to things like money and control over the environment and mm -hmm. having the right talent. And basically at that time, California was the place to be. Mm -hmm. It was. Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. And here we are today in California, <laughs> filming away. But yes, it's a, and um, yeah, I, I just think that that's what is and that's why it is the you know, entertainment capital of the world for mm -hmm. motion pictures at the very least. Exactly. So obviously location is important, especially for, for directors mm -hmm. because then they can control their environment. Yes. And it became even more so as time went on because of the advent of sound, as obviously was probably the mm -hmm. huge one right there. And a lot of other technology actually has kind of changed and woven in and out mm -hmm. of film history, including of course color becoming a very big deal as well too. Yes. And the latest one, which actually kind of leads me into my next big groundbreaker, mm -hmm is digital. Oh, yeah. We're basically in a digital age of cinema right now. And for me, one of the people that I think is quite important to all of that is George Lucas. Oh, I agree. Um, yeah. You know, in the 70s, he was very big in trying to find new ways to edit that used digital or mm -hmm. computers, essentially, at that point in time. And he developed Industrial Light and Magic, mm -hmm. which was his specialty house that worked basically on computer-based editing, as well as what we know today with the digital effects that we see in movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting about um, Lucas, and sometimes people don't really know, mm -hmm. is he actually had a small offshoot division uh, that was responsible for developing some of the early techniques for computer-based animation. Mm -hmm. And that company was eventually spun off and sold to Steve Jobs of Apple fame and became what we now know as Pixar Animation. Oh, that's fascinating. I and didn't know that way. they released one of the first full-length animated feature films in Toy Story. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, what was one of George Lucas's first things that he did with Industrial Light and Magic? Um, I don't know the exact first one. I know one of the more important ones, obviously, was Star Wars. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things Absolutely. he was finding that there was some difficulty in producing some of the scenes that he wanted to produce, and that the only way he could really figure out how to do it was using some computer animation mm -hmm. and basically hired the people to do it. Gosh, so he's a true groundbreaker, and he was, was he sort of making it as he went along and just, you know... And I think so. A lot of it was, lot of was experimental. I mean, computers were in the early stage back mm -hmm. then, and it wasn't until they were actually able to get a lot of this technology down into a personal computer mm -hmm. that they were able to find that this was a growing side of the industry. 
And of course today, so many films have digital special effects involved in them. We have so many special effects houses that mm -hmm. are all computer generated. Mm -hmm. Even to the actual exhibition of films now is completely different. You know, we're not sending celluloid film and we're not sending film to the theaters to be projected. It's digital. It's we're actually transmitting ones <laughs> and zeros. That's all it is. That's true. Well, special effects did not just begin with George Lucas. He certainly, you know, was a, uh, definitely a groundbreaker, true, innovator. True. But uh, back in the day, before they had, you know, computers and the cloud and all these things <laughs> and the digital um, awareness, they had uh, to wing it and do their own special effects via stop motion uh, or um, coordinating, highly coordinating uh, different stunts and things. Buster Keaton is a great example of that. A uh, silent film actor that uh, did at least 95% of his own stunts through the uses of um, using Which is fame. unheard of today. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Nobody would insure him. Right? <laughs> Not today exactly. if he was a present day actor. <laughs> but, uh, you know, doing effects where he would have these giant, you know, um, fans blowing on him and he would lean into them and you know to create this effect or there's also in the uh, of course I'm going to default back to Chaplin but <laughs> um, the gold rush there is a great scene where there's a cabin is teetering um, back and forth on uh, the tip of a cliff um, and there's snow coming in the one doors opening on one end one doors opening on the other and they're sliding but it was all uh, you know pivoting on a set mm -hmm. and then the wind would blow in and there was a slick surface on the ground as well as on their shoes to allow them to look like they were you know scrambling to get their footing so you know nowadays I imagine that you, you could be you know green screened or you know digitally effect but uh, back in the day they they may do and they broke ground there as well exactly. as best that they could and I'm sure it was all experimental back in that time as well too they probably mm -hmm. had many failures just like they did with trying to come up with different yes. computer animation mm -hmm. techniques can you think of any Colossal failures, or not even colossal, <laughs> but you know, and any anything that maybe just uh, you know when you've watched something that has special effects in it, and you think, I could have done that better on my, my computer. I don't know that I would necessarily call them failures. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think my personal opinion might actually be that we've maybe gone a little too far with digital effects mm -hmm. to the point where they are now dominating films and actually overpowering the performances that actors are allowed to give, because some of the things that you actually can produce digitally now obviously are things that a real world actor can't produce. And I don't know if the technology is quite there some of the times mm -hmm. to actually make it as realistic as having an actual human being. Do you feel that that's budgetary? I think it's limitation in technology. Maybe it's mm -hmm. budgetary, but yeah. I mean, I think for the most part it's limitation in technology and mm -hmm. really is that what the audience wants to see? Mm -hmm. You know, I think with younger viewers, they enjoy the digital effects and like you know, what kind of what we grow up on. For you and I, we, we grew up on movies from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and True. they were doing that. And now the younger generation, they're used to video games and, and things like that. And that's where I think the big connection it comes was. into play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that uh, digital effect. So it's sort of what they expect. And it was completely understandable and it's always still very entertaining, I would say. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, for me, those are the big groundbreakers, yeah. at least of the past couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, I, we were talking about um, Industrial Light and Magic, and mm -hmm. I know that's a lot of in-studio um, production, and we haven't talked really about going out on location. And there are films that were made that actually broke ground by getting their entire crews together and moving them out of the state of California, their comfort zone. Which is completely commonplace now yes. in filmmaking, mm -hmm. but I'm sure way back when was a big logistical task. Yes, way back when, yeah. <laughs> well, they, they would do, it, when they were based here in California, and, you know, it wasn't the easy, you know, let's all, we're going to load everybody up on a jet, and we're going to go, and then we've got these trucks. And it was uh, much more laborious. They went by train. You know, there's several silent films that have a history of packing everybody together and going for it. Um, you know, I had mentioned the gold rush earlier, and right. they did do that. They went up to Northern California to shoot in the snow and, and all that. But there's also a really great movie that I love called On the Town and that's with uh, Frank Sinatra mm -hmm. and Gene Kelly and they went out and filmed in New York and in, there's a great scene in Rockefeller Center um, near you know, they're they're all on the town they're all over the place all over New York but it was hard to control the crowds naturally I mean you've got you know Gene Kelly dancing up the storm and you've got uh, Frank Sinatra there in New York right and there are some shots if you watch that closely uh, you, they'll you know pan up a little bit oh and there's the crowd we you know watching the production and then pan back and they did have some challenges but you know that actually I think 
kind of adds to the excitement of it, you know, uh, to, to catch some of that sometimes. But it, it can be, I imagine, a huge financial feat and uh, to get people to get out to locations now and things and, exactly. and do that. But. Well, with modern technology, again, it's even easier. Mm -hmm. You can fly somebody on a plane halfway across the world, shoot what you want okay. to, and be back in a couple of days. Do you think Couldn't that, do that back then. Can they now, you know, say this uh, actor, actor A needs to stay in the Los Angeles area, we'll use as an example, but the majority of the production is taking place in <laughs> Siberia. Can they do, you know, the filming here and you know, of that one actor that needs to stay behind for whatever reason and digitally, digitally yes. insert them later, of yeah. course. That technology all now exists. That's amazing. They all don't have to be exactly. together. Well, Just times like have changed. <laughs> audio dubbing over anything that might need to be done can mm -hmm. all actually be done through phone lines now. Yeah. Oh, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> times have changed, that's for sure. Well, as you can see, we've got a lot of opinions and varying opinions at times um, about Hollywood and motion picture groundbreakers. But I really feel that based on our conversation, we're just going to see more and more as the years keep going. And uh... No, I think that's it. Oh, so stop with Lucas for you? And yeah, over. that's it. It's Is that done. it? It's done. I think it stopped at Chaplin, so... <laughs> we'll see, as you can see, we have opinions, and we could go on forever about it, but we'd love to hear what you think and who you think is a Hollywood groundbreaker and people who are trailblazers in the industry. So feel free to contact us and put your input in. Sounds good. Okay. Love to hear from people. Absolutely.